Morning Church. Don't be confused by the title. No, it's not a reflection of the fact that I was only asked to preach on Wednesday night. And I hope it's not going to be a reflection on the fact that you're going to get what I don't know. Hopefully you'll get what I've learned that I don't know. The strange expression, things we don't know, we don't know, has been attributed to Donald Rumsfeld. Now, he was the Secretary of Defense in the George W. Bush administration. And he was being questioned and was talking about the intricacies of international espionage and intelligence sharing and all that sort of stuff. At one point, he said, but of course, there are things we don't know, we don't know. And that's kind of been immortalized. But I'm, I'm pretty sure he didn't imagine that or come up with that for the first time. In fact, I kind of remember from my old school days that a man called Socrates said something very similar all the way back. Or was it Spider-Man? <laughs> I'll have to check with Kevin Smith, you know, about that. However, it's a truism which does apply to us. It applies to our Christian lives. It applies particularly to the way we study Scripture, and even more particularly to how we understand and appropriate the things that Jesus did and the things that Jesus said. Let me explain. The Lord Jesus Christ walked on this earth 2,000 years ago. That's a long time ago. And when we look back at that, we don't understand the cultures, we don't understand the religions, we don't understand the traditions at all. Even the Jewish tradition, we know the Jewish folk of our day, but we don't know what they believed back then, other than what we've read in books and commentaries and so on. We have little idea of their culture. So often we look at things that Jesus did and Jesus said, and we find them difficult to understand. Why did he do that? Why did the people respond that way to what he said? Problem is, you see, we are so often spiritually and mentally lazy. And when we get in our study of the scripture, or just our reading of the scripture, to a part where we kind of have this nagging thought that this is something we don't know, we don't know. We know there's a kind of a void here, and there's something more here, but then we say, ah, I'm too pressurized. Ah, the children are calling me. Ah, I've got to do work. Golf, or whatever it is. And we rush on instead of pausing and praying and saying, Holy Spirit of the living God, there's something here that I don't know. I don't even know I don't know it. But please help me. Please reveal to me what it is so that I can better appreciate what your word says and better glorify Jesus and understand him more and learn to love him more. I think the best way I can explain what I'm trying to say is to take you to a concrete example. About a week and a bit ago, I was reading through John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. I confess that the Gospel of John is one of my very, very favorite parts of all Scripture. I find myself often defaulting to reading through John's Gospel again. And I was reading chapter 6, verses 1 to 15, when something struck me. But to give you the context, I would like to read it through with you, so that you have the whole picture. John 6, verses 1 through 15. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up to the hillside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip asked him, answered him, 200 denarii will not buy enough bread for each to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Uh, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. <laughs> but how far will that go among so many? You know, there were 5,000 men there. That means that the crowd's total was probably about 15,000 at least. The Jewish folk only counted men, sorry girls. So when they say there was a crowd like this of men, you can believe it was a much, much bigger crowd of people. Jesus said, have these people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. Well, clearly, Jesus didn't go around 
with a loaf in his hand to 15,000 people. We would have been still distributing bread when the sun came up the next day. So he gave it to his disciples. His disciples were breaking the bread. And as they did, this incredible miracle took place. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 basket, baskets with pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again into the hills by himself. Okay, now we know the story pretty well. Most of us have read it you know, dozens of times, as had I. But when I got to those last verses, verses 14 and 15, I had one of those, uh-oh, there's something I don't know, I don't even know here. It says, after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Now, why would they say that? That was this nagging little thought that popped into my head. But why? Why do they think he's the prophet that is to come into the world? Where do they even get that notion from? And they feel so strongly about it that they want to actually take him by force, march him into Jerusalem, and enthrone him. And Jesus knew that that was not going to happen, so he withdrew from them. But why did they get that notion? Why did they think he was the prophet who was to come into the world? Now, at this point, I could have just ignored the question. I could have done what we so often do. Oh, no, I haven't got time for that now. Uh, yes, dear, I'm coming to do the dishes. Not. <laughs> or found some other excuse. But I didn't. I paused and I prayed. Please, Holy Spirit, why won't you show me this? I mean, I didn't even know what to ask you about really, but because there's something here. I don't get it. But clearly the people of that day, they understood. You see, they would have understood the things that Jesus was doing because they were steeped in the culture and the religion of the day. We're not. So we don't understand a lot of these things. So the first place we often go to is a Bible dictionary or commentary. Again, can I give you a piece of advice? Don't rush to commentaries. Commentaries are good. They're part of the resource. They're part of the things that God has given us. But don't rush to them. First ask the question of God. Lord, what is happening here? Please, Holy Spirit, come and lead me into truth. You might be surprised that he takes you in a different path. And he might well encourage you to look at this commentaries in the Bible, dictionaries and so on. But pause first and ask the question. If you go to the commentaries, you'll probably find that some of them, not all of them, will tell you that the rabbis, the teachers of Jesus' day, they would have pointed people and us to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. And in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, Moses, the great prophet, the first of the great prophets, really, I suppose, said this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. So now, those folk would have been steeped in this tradition. They would have been brought up on their mother's knees, being told the story of the great prophet Moses, who had promised a Messiah. One day somebody would come, a greater prophet than Moses. Somebody who would speak the words that would give them freedom and dignity and life and eternity. And they must listen to him. So, the most obvious answer to the question that I'm posing, you know, what would the people of that day have understood Jesus as saying, is they would have been fully cognizant of the story of the Exodus. So they would have understood the story where Moses is leading the people through the wilderness and the people are grumbling because they're hungry. And Moses goes to God and meets with him. And God says to him, Moses, I personally, I, God, will provide for your people. And the next morning, the people went out of their tents. And there, covering with the morning dew, was the manna. It tasted like sesame seeds and honey. 
and it fed the Israelites, a group of probably about a million and a half people, for 40 years until they started moaning about this food. So they would have understood the story. They would have known the story. Now, in the same chapter, John chapter 6, Jesus had actually confirmed this. Because Jesus actually taught the following. He said, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then a bit later, I am the bread of life. So that seems to be the answer to my question. The answer to the question seems to be, well, okay, that's what they would have understood, the people of that day. And yes, okay, now I understand it. Now I understand what I didn't know before, etc. Ah, but still the nagging thought remained. There's more sunshine. Something more is here. There's still stuff you don't know. You don't even know you don't know it yet. Now listen up. So I started to think and to pray about it, and I started to consider the great prophets that came after Moses. So if I had to ask you, for instance, who do you think was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament after Moses? Who would you call out? Any, any suggestions? You know, prophets like, prophets like Isaiah were writing prophets, and it was really only the generations after them that benefited. But the, the greatest prophet of all was Elijah. Elijah was the one who took on the prophets of Baal, brought down fire from heaven, did incredible supernatural acts of wonder before the people. The great Elijah. But we would be wrong. Because one came after Elijah from among his brethren, his brethren, his disciple, his huntlanger, by the name of Elisha. And before Elijah ascended up into heaven, Elisha cried out, Lord, that his mantle might fall upon me. I ask you for the double anointing of his mantle upon my life. And it happened. Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah. He was the great prophet of all of Israel in all of the history since Moses. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I started to look into two kings. The obvious place to go if you want to find out about prophets like Elisha is you go to kings. So I went to two kings, and I read until I got to chapter 4, verse 42 to 44. And I want you to listen carefully to what it says there. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God, that's Elisha, 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men? His servant asked. But Elisha answered, Give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. Oh my, here was my light bulb moment. So Jesus was doing something that Elisha had foreshadowed all those years before. He was replicating but exceeding the greatness of the greatest prophet that had come before. Think about it. Elisha fed 100 people with 20 barley loaves. Jesus Somewhere between 5,000 and 15,000 with five. How's that? How's that for going abundantly beyond what the great prophet had done? Elisha performed the miracle through the hands of his servant. He didn't get up and go and feed them himself. Jesus, he performed the miracle through the hands of his disciples. Elisha predicted that God had said there will be abundant leftover from this. Jesus knew there would be. And he said to his disciples, go and collect it. And they collected 12 baskets, one for every tribe of Israel. I mean, a staggering demonstration of the precise fulfillment that one greater would come. No wonder they wanted to grab him and make him king. Because they knew what we don't know, we don't even know. They would have instantly put two and two together and understood the implications of this. 
You know, it shouldn't be surprising to us, though, because Jesus himself had given us clues along the way. Let me give them to you for your interest's sake. In Matthew 11, and again in Matthew 17, Jesus likened John the Baptist to the prophet Elijah. Remember, he said, if you will accept it, he is coming, he, John the Baptist, is coming in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for the Lord. Who did Elijah prepare the way for? For Elisha. Elijah prepared the way for the great prophet to step onto the stage of history and to do what he had been called of God to do. Do you know what the word Elisha means in the Hebrew language? It means God's salvation. And then comes John the Baptist thousands of years later. And John the Baptist, coming in the spirit of Elijah, prepares the way for Jesus, right? And do you know what Jesus' name, Yish, Jesus, in the Greek of that day, you know what it means? Guess. Guess. God's salvation. Another clue he gave us. Do you know the story of the transfiguration on Mount Hermon? So Jesus takes his disciples and then only three of them go up into the higher reaches of Mount Hermon. And there those three, sleep as they may be, suddenly looked up and they say that Jesus started to shine like the noonday sun. His garments were radiant white. His face and eyes were bright, 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 bright. They were awestruck. And then appearing next to them were two witnesses. Guess who those witnesses were, even if you don't know the story. Elijah, Moses. The two witnesses, the very ones that I've been talking about this morning. The great prophet who came and prepared the way. The great lawgiver, Moses. And then, as they were absolutely awestruck, a cloud rolled over the mountain and started to shine with the Shekinah glory of heaven. And a voice sounded loud and clear from the Shekinah glory. This is my son, of whom I am well pleased. And then, listen to him. Now, do you remember the word of prophecy that Moses gave, recorded? I read it out just now. I'll repeat it for you. The thing that started this whole tr prophetic train in motion. He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him. We've seen the clues were here right in front of our faces in the scripture of this perfect and wonderful fulfillment of prophecy and scripture in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now at last I had a fuller picture. Now at last this feeling of there's stuff you don't know that you don't know you don't know started to go. Started. Because I have a sneaking feeling that when one day I'm tottering along in my zimmer, I'll hear that voice sing again, look again, sunshine. <coughs> there's yet more here. But here's where I want to go to with you this morning. Stopping, pausing, asking the Holy Spirit, not being mentally lazy, developing a new habit of actually seeking rather than dismissing, doesn't just end in intellectual satisfaction. It ends in far more than that. My wife has started doing 200-word crossword puzzles. 200 words. And she sits with the crossword puzzle in front of her, and I'm sitting on another chair trying to watch TV, and she'll shout out, 17 letter word meaning ignorance. I won't even tell you the suggestions I make to the. <laughs> all of them wrong. But you know, when we finish the crossword together, there's a great sense of intellectual satisfaction. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something far deeper, far more than that. We come to the place of an awe inspiring. Revelation, when understanding that this book that we hold in our hands is faithful and trustworthy and contains the most meticulous, most meticulous description of truth and reality. And then we come to a second understanding. 
Jesus fulfilled it all. Right down to the last detail. Why? For he definitely knew what he knew. And he fulfilled it perfectly. You know, he wasn't fooling when he said the following. This is recorded in Matthew 5, 17 to 18. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prof or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear. Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Accomplished also means fulfilled. In Jesus, it's all fulfilled, down to its most meticulous detail. So not only as we have this kind of experience, do we realize the veracity and value of the scripture, we are filled with a sense of awe as to who Jesus really is, for only God can do that. There's no ways this can be stage managed. You know, Spielberg in his greatest days could not conjure up a movie script like that. There's nobody who can come after the act and fix up the little details. It is perfect and seamless, spanning the millennia and finding their fulfillment in Jesus. Now we get the appreciation all over again of what passages like Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 mean. Listen again, those of you who are not familiar with it. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets and at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. <coughs> So today I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to seek. I want you to encourage you to develop a new habit. Shake loose of the mental and spiritual apathy which says, eh, yes, there's something there, but, 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 you know, I haven't got time for that now kind of stuff. Break free of that and rather stop. Ask questions. Ask questions of the Holy Spirit. Lord, why did Jesus say that? Why did he do that? Why did the people think that? Ask the fundamental question, what did the people of that day understand by it? That's a great question. It sets us on a path of discovery. We can find understanding. And this experience all of us can have, if the following applies. One, we realize that there are things in Scripture which we really don't know we don't know. There's mystery in Scripture. There's a depth that we can plummet. We can live our entire lives and still not plummet the full depths of the revelation of God in the Bible. But if we don't acknowledge that, will we ever seek for it? We will remain superficial and skirt along like a fly on the top of a stagnant pool. And as we acknowledge this more, there's stuff we don't know, we don't even know we don't know it yet. Let's ask God, and then ask questions. Probe. Now, the Holy Spirit will respond to us. Why do I say that with such confidence? Because Jesus has told us so. Listen to what he said. It's recorded in John chapter 16, verses 12 to 14. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and make, making it known to you. And then a little later, in the same passage of Scripture, he started to pray. He prayed to his father and said, Oh, Father, send the blessed comforter that they might know, that, that he might reveal truth to them. This is his heart's desire and prayer that we would be a people who seek him and find him and through that glorify him and come to live like him on this planet. And let me tell you, this is not a boring intellectual exercise. It is the most exhilarating spiritual life-giving exercise. Yes, it stimulates our minds, but our, 
our spirits, we are engaged at the deepest level of our being when we make these realizations. I want to leave you with just two scriptures. One is from Deuteronomy. If you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. And the last one is from Matthew chapter 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. I want to pray for us as a people. I'll ask the worship group to come up and join me at the front. I'm not asking that we have a time after this of conviction, you know, or standing up and, oh, I'll study the Word of God, you can count on me stuff. I ask only that as we're worshipping, you reflect on these things. And you start to ask the questions, oh Lord, I want to know you like that. I want your word to come alive for me like that. I therefore will seek you, Lord. Help me. Help me to find you. Open my eyes that I may see Jesus. To be able to reach out and touch him and say that I love him. I want to, I want to be the subject, Lord, of what Paul wrote when he said to you, may the Lord give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we may know him better. Can I ask that we, we do that? As we worship, there will be places we sing that you can stand up and pray out loud if you choose to. You can go down on your knees or, or whatever it is. But think on these things. And say in your heart, Lord, I don't want to be an apathetic, superficial. I want to be a deep diver into your word. Help me, Holy Spirit of God. Lord, I pray that this would be our reality. You've given us all the tools we need. You've given us this incredible record, this, this document that has stood 2,000 years. And beyond that, another three or four or five. You've given us the infilling of your Spirit and the anointing of your Spirit. Insight and illumination. You've given us your companionship. You've given us your church full of teachers. You've given us bookshelves full of commentaries and dictionaries and everything we need. What a blessed, blessed people we are. Please, Lord, open our eyes that we may see Jesus. Amen.